coming tonight. I'm excited to, for everyone to be here. This is kind of loud. All right, whoops. All right, if that's too loud, just let me know. But um, okay, so tonight we're here today because we have an exciting event happening next Monday on November 2nd. So Maria Goretti is going to be coming to the cathedral. And so it's something we're all really excited about. Um, it's something that's very special. Not too many, only a few, let me see, this isn't working. Only a few places in Tyler are actually getting um, this really special occasion to happen in their parish. And so November 2nd, Maria Goretti, her body will be coming. And it'll be available for public viewing from about 9 a.m. on Monday until 1 a.m. on Tuesday. And so there'll be a Mass at 7 p.m. also with the bishop. So it's exciting times. And so that kind of led to a lot of different questions about three main things. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. And so the first is, why is it that as Catholics, we pray, for, we pray for the dead? I can move this up. Or why is it as Catholics that we pray to the dead, is the first question. The second question is, why do we have relics anyways, like the body of Maria Goretti? Why do we venerate relics? And then the third question is, why do we pray for those who have died? And so it's three questions pretty common as Catholics that we may receive from people who aren't Catholic. And so with this special event happening next week, we thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about these topics. And then before I answer those questions, I do want to mention on the Tyler Diocese, um, Peyton and, and Father White have done some video series on Maria and her life, and it's a great, they're great videos. I would encourage you to go to the diocese website to find those to, in preparation for her coming next week. And then finally, the bishop has also asked us to join with him in a novena for the next nine days in preparation for her coming because we're going to pray this novena particularly for victims of abuse and then for the conversion of their perpetrators and so it's a great thing that we're doing that's kind of really all related to Maria coming next week, her body coming next week. So before I begin talking about our specific questions and topics for tonight let's just begin in prayer so we can kind of really prepare our hearts and minds for that. I don't know if Father wants to lead us or if Okay. All right. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, thanks for allowing us to gather together today to learn more about you and, and, your, and the great things that you do in our lives, um, particularly modeled in the saints. The saints are a great picture of the masterpieces of your creation whenever we cooperate fully with your grace. So thanks, thank you again for allowing us this opportunity and for blessing us this day. We also ask the Holy Spirit will come into our hearts today as we reflect on the different teachings of the church so that we can come to know you more and grow closer to you through our, a better understanding of the saints and of life after death. And we ask this in, in your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alright, so the first question is, as Catholics, why do we pray to the dead? Now first, if you're talking with people who aren't Catholic, Catholics were not exclusive, the only Christian group that does this. A few Christian denominations, other than the, us Catholics, would pray to the dead, including maybe some of the Anglicans, maybe some Lutherans, some Methodists, but a large majority of the Protestants, especially that we'll meet here in East Texas, this is something that's a little unusual or foreign to them, this idea of praying to the people who have died. And so what do we mean by that when we say we pray to the dead? And I put quotations around praying to the dead because it's very important as we're talking to people about this practice that we define terms and so that's the first thing we want to talk about is let's define terms because when in conversation with anyone but especially about the faith you want to make sure that everyone's on the same page as to what different words mean when you're talking about the Trinity or the Incarnation or talking about salvation it's very important to define terms that you can make sure that you mean the same thing when you're using different terminology. 
and it happens in our own lives too, day to day. Um, I don't know if, if a lot of you are from Texas, you probably have this happen. I have some family members from Colorado and they really get annoyed when they're down here and when I say I'm going to go get like a soda, I say I'm going to go get a Coke and I come back with a Diet Dr. Pepper. They just think it's crazy that we refer to all caffeinated drinks as Coke here in, in the South commonly. So they say either soda or pop or, or soda, uh, soda dr soft drink and so we have to define our terms. And so just like in day-to-day -day life, we need to do that in understanding our faith. We have to make sure we start with that. And so what do we mean when we say the word pray? That we pray to the angels and to the saints and to Mary? Well, there's a few ways that you can use this word pray. Now today in America, the most common way that Christians use this term pray, particularly Protestants, is that when they say we pray, they're talking solely to prayer that goes to God, the Supreme Being, the conversation you have with God, period. It's exclusive to that. It's this idea of worship and adoration that goes to God alone. That's what they often mean when they say that we pray, is it's exclusive to God. But if you look at the Webster Dictionary, there's actually more than that as the meaning of the word pray. And if you were to travel to um, Australia, South Africa, or even Britain, and, and, um, to London, you would see that they even use this word pray in a different way even today. And so there's a, the other definition for this word is ask, that I'm going to ask someone for something. And so if you were standing before a judge in London and you wanted to ask him something, you may say, judge, I pray you make this sentence lighter, or I pray you listen to my request. And so this word pray in its ancient form means to ask. And so as Catholics, when we say that we pray to Mary and the saints, we're actually asking them for something. And so if you look in Webster's Dictionary, you'll see this is one of the definitions that Webster even talks about, is that pray can also mean to ask. And so we have to make sure that our um, Protestant brothers and sisters understand that we are not praying to the angels and to the saints and to Mary as if they are God because we know there's only one true God. We're simply asking them for something. So what are we asking them for? Well, we're asking them to pray for us. We're asking them to make intercession for us to God. And I'll come talk more about that here in a minute. But we want, we're asking Mary and the saints and the angels to pray for us. Well, why is it that they would even pray for us, be able to or want to. Well, we can look at ourselves in our own day-to-day -day lives here on earth. I can ask my family and my friends and, and any of you to please pray for me, just as you can ask me to pray for you. And we will f gladly do that. Why? Why is it that we're supposed to pray for each other? And why is it that others can pray for us? Well, the answer to both these questions is the same because of love. Because we love each other, we want people to get to heaven. We want God to help them. We want the, God to help answer their prayers and help with whatever they need. And so because of love, I want to pray for you and I hope you want to pray for me. And so love is really this core thing that is the reason for this intercessory prayer. An intercessory prayer means to make intercession. You're going to intercede for someone to God. Well, what the saints in heaven they also can make intercession for us. They also can intercede and pray to God for us. And why? For the same reason, because of love. Because they love us and their love continues even after they leave this earthly life, their love actually becomes even more perfected. They, want, they love us and they want to help us and they want to intercede to God for us. And so just as we can ask each other to pray, we can ask the saints and the angels in heaven to pray for us as well. And one of the things that it's important to know too about this idea of pr pray, asking those in heaven to pray for us, this is a very ancient practice. From the very beginning of, of the Christian faith, of the Christian church, the Christians did this. Um, this is a picture here of these inscriptions that were found inside a tomb of St. Sebastian from one of the early centuries of the church. And on it, in various languages, it says, St. Peter and Paul pray for us. And so you see this in some of the ancient um, tombs showing the early Christians did this from the beginning because they understood this is something that we can do and should do. So it's important to understand that as well. 
And so as I mentioned, those in heaven are perfectly united to God now. Their love is perfected. They are now perfectly united to God in heaven. And so because they're united to God, they're also united to God's will. So because God loves us, so they love us as well. And they love us even more perfectly than they would have had they still been alive here on earth. And because God desires all men to be saved, the saints in heaven also have that same desire. They desire all men to be saved. And so because of love, just like they would have prayed for us if they were alive today, that doesn't stop. That love does not end after death from this earthly life. They continue to pray for us. They continue to desire to pray for us. They desire that even more strongly than they did here on earth because their love is stronger and more perfected than it was when they were alive here on earth. So the saints in heaven want to pray for us because of love. They want to help us get to heaven in any way possible. And so one of the things God allows them to do is to continue to pray for us even after they've left this earthly life. Now sometimes people may respond to me, people particularly who aren't Catholic, and they'll say, well, in Scripture, there's a particular passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And in this passage, it says that Jesus is our one mediator between God and men. That Jesus Christ alone is the mediator. And so they'll often say, if Jesus is the only mediator, then why are we asking those in heaven to mediate for us? This seems like this is against, the, against what the Bible is teaching us. And I would say, well, amen, Jesus is the one mediator. By asking the saints to pray for us in heaven doesn't change that. And we can look at Scripture, because in the Bible, we're commanded to pray for each other. St. Paul tells the Christians in many of his writings, and in many of his letters, particularly in Thessalonians, he tells the Christians, pray for me as I pray for you. Continue to pray for me and the others so that we'll continue to be faithful. So St. Paul asks for their prayers and commands them to pray for him. And even in the context of this particular passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you read it in its entirety, St. Paul is actually telling the Christians in verses 1 through 4 to pray for other people. He's telling the Christians that their prayers and petitions need to be offered for everyone. And so he's telling them, you need to be praying for everyone. And then he'll continue to say that this is good and pleasing to God, who wills everyone to be saved. And then he goes on to say in the next line, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. So St. Paul is telling us we should be praying for each other. So is Paul contradicting himself by saying we should be praying for each other, but yet Jesus is the only mediator? And the answer is no, because we have to understand what's happening. And this is a really good depiction that's from this book called Unabridged Christianity. But what it shows us is that Jesus is the one mediator, but because we're united to him, he allows us to be secondary mediators. He allows us to participate in his mediation. So if one person, if, if I ask you to pray for me and then you pray, your, your prayers are still going to God through Jesus because, of our, because we're united to Jesus through our baptism. And so there's this idea of being secondary mediators. So Jesus is the primary mediator, the one mediator, and because we're united to him, we can pray for each other through Christ. And so this is in no way contradicting this idea that Jesus is the one mediator. <coughs> If it did, then the Bible shouldn't be telling us we need to pray for each other, which St. Paul does time and time again. So St. Paul is showing us that there, Jesus is the one mediator, but we are still to pray for each other. It's very important as Christians because we're a communion of saints. And we're going to talk about that word several times here in a minute. Because we're united to each other through Christ, we should continue to pray for each other. Now when we speak about Mary and the saints and those in heaven... They're still members of the body of Christ. And so here on earth, St. Paul tells us that Jesus is the head and we're part of the church, which is his body. And there's one body in Christ. And all of us who are united to Christ through baptism are part of that one body. Well, whenever we die, that doesn't change. There doesn't all of a sudden now become two bodies of Christ and one head. There's still one body, the church. And that's whether you're alive on earth or you've passed from this life to the next life. If you're united to Christ, then you're a part of this one body, His church. 
And so it doesn't end at this earthly life that that changes. And this is also the word, the communion of saints. And so the communion of saints is this union with, is kind of what that word communion means, this union with all those who are saints. And when we, and when we say this word saints, it can apply to those in heaven who are now capital S, saints, they have, be, they have kind of, they've achieved their final victory, they've reached their, they've, they've received their imperishable crown of eternal life in heaven, so they're kind of capital S saints. Here on earth, we, we can still say that you have saints, but it's a small s, and in scripture you see this a lot, St. Paul refers to the saints here on earth, because anyone who's been baptized and who's in a state of grace can be considered saints, there, saints can just mean holy ones. Those who are united to Christ in a state of grace can be considered small, lowercase s, saints. So we're still a communion of saints if we're united to Christ. And what we're going to talk about is death doesn't change that. So those in, in heaven are perfectly united to Christ. Those of us on earth are imperfectly united to Christ, but we're still united to Christ. And if we're united to Christ, then we're a part of this communion of saints. And everyone who is a part of this communion of saints loves each other, cares for each other, and wants to do whatever we can to help each other get to heaven. So those in heaven have achieved that, and they still want us to join them one day. Now, because we are, in a sense, praying, asking those who have died for something, for intercession, sometimes people who aren't Catholic will say, well, but the Bible forbids us to communicate with people who have died. It forbids us to communicate with dead people. And so how do we respond to that question? So this is particularly found in the book of Deuteronomy. And in that, God does forbid what's called necromancy. Necromancy is this kind of fancy word that just means basically communicating with the dead or calling on the dead. And so the scripture does forbid this. But we have to understand what this word means and what the context of it means in Deuteronomy. This word is actually referring to that idea of sorcery, witchcraft, conjuring up spirits. So this idea of trying to communicate with the dead to get information or receive information from them. So whether it's doing some type of um, witchcraft like prayers or going to someone to try to find the soul of a, a, a dead person and talk with them. Um, even like the Ouija board idea where you're trying to call upon dead people, communicate with dead people. That is forbidden. It was forbidden in the Old Testament, forbidden still today. And God does not want that and He did not want that at the time of Deuteronomy because He wanted the Israelites to know He is the one true God and He has sent them prophets and He has sent them his word through various ways, they needed to rely on that. They didn't, did not need to be calling up people who have died and try to get, gain information. God will provide them with the information they need to know. They shouldn't go looking for it in, in ways of sor sorcery and witchcraft because that also opens up doors for evil things as well. And so we still don't do that. It's still forbidden to do that today. And when we pray to those in heaven, when we ask those in heaven to pray for us, we're not doing anything like this. We're not trying to gain information from them. We're not trying to call up the spirit of St. Augustine and, and try to communicate with him. We're simply calling upon those in heaven and asking them to, to hear our call and ask, and ask them to pray for us and to continue praying for us. So it's a very different idea than this idea of what was called necromancy in the book of Deuteronomy. And so we can tell our, our Protestant brothers and sisters that we're not practicing necromancy in any way. We're simply just asking our brothers and sisters who are now in heaven to keep praying for us just as they would if they were still here on earth. Now one of the other things we can also emphasize is that we also know that death, the end of this earthly life, does not separate us from Christ. And so because of this, we are all still a part of the communion of saints, as I've already referenced before. But in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, a really beautiful passage, but what St. Paul is telling us is that he says specifically, neither death nor life nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And so St. Paul tells us, even after the end of this earthly life, when we die and move on to the next life, death does not separate us from the love of Christ. If we're united to Christ in this earthly life, death does not change that. And in reality, it will actually become more perfected. Our, our, us being united to Christ will become even more perfected. And so because those in heaven are even more intimately united to Christ, they're going to love us even more perfectly and desire us to be in heaven with them even more. One of the other passages in the scripture is Luke chapter 20, verse 38, where Jesus tells us that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And it's to emphasize that those in heaven are still alive. And they're actually even more alive than we are because of their, of their being perfectly united to God because they're now in heaven. So those in heaven have died, passed on from this earthly life, but they're not dead in the sense of they have no idea what's going on or they have no connection to us. They're actually more alive than they were here on earth. And another example of this is Luke chapter 9. At the transfiguration, if you remember, when Jesus is transfigured on that mountain, you have Moses and Elijah who are there now present with him and, and communicating with Jesus. And then Peter, James, and John witness this. And so this shows us that those who have died are still alive. They're still aware of what's going on because Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about what was happening. So they're still alive. They're still aware of what's going on and still alive. Um, and so that image of the transfiguration um, doesn't show us to call upon the dead because that was Jesus. Peter, James, and John didn't call upon those uh, of Moses and Elijah. So that's something Jesus in a particular way did that he can do because he's God but it shows us Moses and Elijah are still alive they're still aware of what's going on and so it shows us that that's the state of those in heaven as well and so then 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where Paul talks about that we're one body in Christ and so again that analogy of when we die we don't become two separate bodies of Christ um, we can't say that those on earth are not members of the body of Christ and those in heaven are and then vice versa. We can't say those of us on earth are members of the body of Christ and those in heaven are not because those in heaven are more perfectly united to Christ. But that's just the passage where we see there's one body in Christ, not two, not three, there's one. And the other thing scripture tells us in James chapter 5 verse 16 is that the prayers of the righteous are very powerful. And no one, no human person is more righteous than those who are in heaven. They are more perfectly righteous than any one of us. And so their prayers are even more powerful than any of ours would be. And so we should call upon those in heaven to pray for us because their prayers are very powerful and very effective. Now one of the other questions that sometimes people will ask is that, well, okay, I can understand maybe they can, they can continue to pray for us, but how can those in heaven, these saints like Mary or St. Augustine or even the angels like St. Michael, how is it that they can hear millions of people praying to them in different languages and they may even have thousands of prayers going out to them at once? So particularly Mary, she may have thousands of people praying to her at the exact same time in different languages. How is it possible that she can even understand this because she's only human? And then so sometimes that we may get accused of saying, well, if you're saying that she can understand all these things and you're treating her like a god or you're treating these saints like gods, saying they can hear millions of people praying at the same time. But that's actually not what we're doing because we have to remember, firstly, those who are in heaven are in heaven. They're no longer on earth. Things are different in heaven. First of all, in heaven, there's no language barrier because God is there and those in heaven are united to God. And God is now giving them this ability to be able to hear our prayers to them, us calling upon them to asking them to pray for us. God is giving them this gift. Because they're united to Him, He's allowing this because He understands the importance of a, commu of a communion. All Christians are a communion. And if we think about how in the beginning... God made us in His image and likeness. What is God? God Himself is a trinity, a trinity of persons, a communion of persons, and He made us in His image. So if God is a communion, then we too have this desire, this kind of intimate 
um, need within our nature to have be a part of this communion and so we have this innate desire to be part of a communion and it doesn't end when we die and go on to heaven so in heaven we still have this appreciation of being a part of this communion and so because God knows he made us for communion even once we're united to him in heaven he gives us this ability to continue to relate to those even on st who are still on earth so he allows them to be able to hear us and there is no language barrier in heaven because if you're united to God God can understand however many languages there are on this on this planet God knows if anyone in any language talks to God he knows what they're saying so he allows the saints in heaven to be able to participate in that because they're united to him it's nothing the saints do on their own power they're united to God and he allows them to do this and then one of the other things that's important to point out to people who aren't necessarily Catholic or who have a question about this practice of asking those in heaven to pray for us is that scripture shows us those in heaven can hear us and there's a few passages where that is the case so in the in the book of Revelation chapter 5 verse 8 and chapter 8 verse 3 to 4 we're shown an image John has this revelation um, of, of events happening in heaven and one of the things that John shows us that he sees is there's one occasion where he talks about the saints in heaven and another occasion he talks about the angels but both of them have these bowls of incense and they take them to God and we're told that these bowls of incense are the prayers from the saints on earth and so they're, we're told that these angels and these saints hear our prayers through this image of them taking this bowl of incense to God and so we can see that as an analogy a depiction that they hear us asking them to pray for us they're praying for us and as they pray for us they're taking their prayers to God interceding for us to him and so we, we see in the book of Revelation that this is happening in this kind of sense of imagery that John shows us and so it's very beautiful but this idea that they're, the bowls of incense are our prayers our prayers reaching out to heaven asking them to pray for us and intercede for us and John shows us this is what's happening in heaven another example is in Psalm chapter 103 this is basically just showing the psalmist is praying and as he prays he's calling out to the angels and he's asking the angels to continue to bless the Lord and he says several things but he's calling on the angels and if scripture is showing us that the psalmist is calling on the angels then it implies that they should be able to hear us if God has this psalmist calling upon the angels then it indicates it should suggest that we too can do the same thing that they can hear us but I think even more beautifully is Luke chapter 15 verse 7 in this passage we're shown Jesus tells us that in heaven when a sinner repents there's great joy and so if the people in heaven if the saints and the angels in heaven know when a saint or when a sinner here on earth converts and they rejoice over this then we also that shows us they're aware of what's happening because God allows them to be it's nothing on their own power but because they're united to God God allows them to be aware of what's happening here on earth so there's joy in heaven when a sinner repents when a sinner converts and then the final passage is in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 we're told that there is a great cloud of witnesses that surround us and it's in, in that passage the writer of Hebrews will go listing many of the saints from the Old Testament who are now in heaven and so he's showing us that along our earthly journey along our earthly pilgrimage with our goal being heaven we have all these witnesses the saints in heaven who are watching us and in a sense you can kind of get this idea they're cheering us on rooting us on encouraging us to persevere to stay in God's grace and so the book of Hebrews doesn't say that but there's this suggestion that they're watching and they, they care about what happens and they love us and they hope that one day we'll join them in heaven as well so we have this cloud of witnesses watching us and so that shows us they're aware of what's happening and that we can reach out to them we can ask those in heaven to pray for us and to continue praying for us and again because their prayers are so powerful then we absolutely should reach out to them because because they care about us they love us they want to help us their prayers are powerful we should call upon those those who are in heaven to continue to pray for us
Now, as baptized Christians, those who are baptized are united to Christ through baptism. And once you're baptized, you become a member of the body of Christ. You become a member of the communion of saints. And as long as we remain in a state of grace, we, re we remain united to Christ. And so we're in this communion. We're in this communion of saints, whether we're here in this life or we've passed on to the next life, we're a part of this communion of saints. We should care for each other. We should love each other. And again, just like those of us here on earth pray for each other, want to help each other in any way we can, it doesn't stop once we leave this earthly life and go on to the next life. And that love, that desire to help us even become stronger and greater, because those in heaven, their will is now perfectly united to God's will. And God wills that everyone be in heaven. And so, hopefully that gives you at least some foundation to help you whenever you have people asking, why is it that we ask those in heaven to pray for us? Why is it we ask them to intercede for us? And so hopefully that will give you some you know, foundational points you can make and hopefully encourage people who aren't Catholic to continue to pray because they too can benefit from the prayers from those in heaven. And so that's why as Catholics we pray to people who, who are in heaven. The, the saints, whether it's the, the saints that are human or the saints that are angels, we pray and a, we pray to them, we ask them to help us. So then that topic leads us into the next topic of relics, because relics are related to saints. And so first we want to talk about what are relics and understand their importance. And then people who aren't Catholic definitely may have a lot of questions as to why we have relics and why we venerate relics and what that means. So with relics, the first question is what are relics? Well, foundationally, relics are what we call sacramentals. Sacramentals are anything that the church sets apart or calls, refers to something as being blessed. And so things the church sets apart and they're intended to help increase our devotion to God, increase our love for God, increase our piety, increase our reverence. So sacramentals are things uh, that do that. And there's a lot of examples. So one example of a sacramental would be holy water. Another example would be a crucifix. Another example could be the rosary or even making the sign of the cross. That act is a sacramental. And these things aren't magical. They're not trying to call God to do something. They don't, even, they don't give us grace, but what they do, sacramentals lead us closer to God. They try to help turn our hearts and our minds closer to God because they're increasing our reverence and our devotion. And so relics are an example of a sacramental because they're intended to help increase our devotion to God, our love for God, increase our piety and our reverence. Again, they're simply things that they don't give us grace, but they're, they're considered set apart and blessed by the church because it, they have the potential to help us become closer to God. With, and with relics, these are just some pictures of some examples. On the top left, that's the scourge of the pillar Christ was scourged on. Um, the bottom left is a piece of the true cross. And then you have Maria Goretti in the middle, her body. And this isn't actually her. She's kind of encased in um, maybe some, I don't know if it's made of plastic. She's encased in something. This isn't actually her body that you're seeing. Her body is within that. And then you have on the other side, um, on the bottom right is, is the skull of one of the saints. It's in France. And then the top right is just an, with an, a reliquary, which is something that you can use to contain the, uh, the relics. And there's just a small fragment of one of the saints' bodies in that. And so with relics, there's three different classes that you can div separate these into. The first class, relics, are going to be considered any parts of the saint's body, whether it's a bone, blood, piece of hair, or if it's an instrument of Christ's passion. So the pillar he was scourged upon, the, the cross, the crown of thorns, the nails, anything related to Christ's passion would be a first class relic or a first class relic would be something from the saint's body. That would be a first class relic. A second class relic is going to be an object that's become sanctified or holy because of close contact with the saint. So maybe something like clothing they would wear throughout their life or shoes they would wear frequently or something they would frequently use in their day-to-day -day life. 
or if the saint was martyred for the faith, the instrument used to kill the saint would become a second-class relic. So, for example, if you go to Assisi in Italy, St. Francis of Assisi and St. Clair of Assisi, they each have on display the clothes that they would wear throughout their life. And so those are an example of second-class relics. They've become sanctified because of their close contact with the saint while they were here alive on earth. And then a third-class relic would be an object that is touched to one of the other two, to a first or second-class relic. So, for example, I, I met a lady who, when um, St. Pope John Paul II was alive, he touched her rosary. And so, because of that, then she now has a third-class relic. Sister Susan, who was here previously, she received a postcard from Mother Teresa when she was alive. So that would be considered like a third-class relic. So relics are, are divided into these three classes. Um, and so the first class relics are, are the highest, the most kind of high, highest revered, highly, most highly revered and, and venerated would be the first class relics, though the second, third class relics are also very special. And so that kind of tells you a little bit about the relics, what we consider to be relics. And then where do we get this idea of having relics? Where does this come from? Well, I'm going to show you some scripture passages that start to give us some, kind of what we would say, some evidence for relics. But even before I do that, even just within our human nature, this idea of having relics is there. Because if you look to even non-Christian religions, they even have relics. So um, there's relics of Confucius and relics of Buddha, Buddha in Buddhism. So you have different non-Christian religions even that will have this practice of having relics from some figure considered holy, and they will give reverence to those things. And so it's not just a Christian thing to have relics. It's not even just a Jewish thing to have relics. It's just something within our, our nature to want to have something to connect us with those people that are special and holy and, and mean something to us in our lives. And so the relics aren't either they're outside of Scripture. They already exist within human nature. But we do have some evidence in Scripture about this idea of relics. The first example would be in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 13 is a story about a man, a, a great prophet, Elisha, and he had died. And in his grave where he was buried and where his bones were, there is another man who ends up being buried. And whenever that dead man's body falls on top of Elijah's bones, that dead man comes back to life. And so it kind of shows us this idea that the bones of Elisha were considered sacred and holy and blessed. And then a miracle was worked through those bones. Now with relics, God can choose to work miracles through relics. And there actually have been many cases and many stories throughout, the, uh, throughout history where there have been cases of miracles. But we don't venerate them and honor them simply because miracles are worked through them. But it is possible that miracles can be worked, that God can work miracles through the relics. Now, in 2 Kings 13, you have Elisha and his bones. So that starts to give us a hint that this idea of honoring and protecting those first-class relics from a saint is important. Now, Matthew chapter 9 is this story of the woman with the hemorrhage who touches Jesus' garment, the fringe of his garment, and she's healed through that. Now, this wouldn't be a relic yet because Jesus was still alive, but it shows us that even Jesus' clothing, God can work miracles through material things. And so after Jesus had died, if someone knew where this garment was, it could be considered, in a sense, a second-class relic, although because it's related to Christ, it may be even considered a first-class relic. I don't know. Um, we don't, I don't know that we know where that garment is. But it shows that Jesus works through material things, and the material things can be instruments for miracles. And so that, again, kind of shows us this evidence for relics. And then in Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 19, we see in the beginning the early Christians already started to honor things that had been sanctified by contact with, someone, with one of the great saints. So Peter, in Acts chapter 5, Peter would walk by and people would lay the people who were sick along the street just hoping that Peter's shadow would touch them because they already started to see that even Peter's shadow was something special because of who Peter was and who God, all the things that God was doing through Peter. And then in Acts chapter 19, people start to take handkerchiefs and aprons that Paul had touched 
and they start to take them to people who are sick and just touching the handkerchief on those who are sick would sometimes cure them. And so the Christians already start to honor and, and venerate things that St. Paul had touched even while he was alive on earth because they saw all that God was doing through St. Paul and they knew he was going to be someone holy and special. And so similar things started to happen even after the time of the Apostles. We can see writings, the early Christian writings, that start to show us that things like the relics started from the very beginning. There's a particular story about a man um, named Bishop Polycarp. When Bishop Polycarp died, it was at the end of the second century, we're told he was burned to death, and as soon as he had died, the Christians quickly go and gather his remains because they wanted to protect them and put them in a place of honor and make sure that his, his remains, his bones, were treated properly with great respect. And then from that time on, you, they would make sure they knew where he was buried, and they would even sometimes keep pieces of fragments of bones to be able to honor those, even if they couldn't be in the place of burial for Polycarp or the other saints. And we start to see that people would continue to do this over the centuries. Christianity was persecuted for the first several hundred years. After around the year 313, when Christianity was not persecuted, people could come out now and start to build churches. And some of the most common sites for churches would be tombs from the holy saints who had died, or holy places, um, whether Jesus had been there or one of the saints had done something at those sites. So holy sites and on tombs would be common places for churches to be built. And so you'd see a lot of churches being built tomb, on tombs and holy places. But then eventually, not every church would be able to be built on a holy site. And so what would start to happen is this tradition of taking a small relic and putting it into the altar began to, to happen, and that even continues today. It's very common for churches when they're being built to have some relic put into the altar. And it's this sense of even though we cannot be at this saint's tomb or at this holy site, we can still be, have this connection by having this relic present in our altar. And so from the very beginning, this practice of either putting a church over a tomb or having a relic in the altar to kind of help connect us to that saint um, began, began within the church. And St. Jerome, who wrote in the 4th century, he even wrote, We do not worship, we do not adore these relics for fear that we should bow down to the creature rather than, rather than the creator. But we do venerate the relics, especially of the martyrs, because as we do so, we're able to adore God, whose martyrs these are even more. And so this idea that we venerate and honor the relics, because in doing that, we're giving greater glory to God. Because we see the great things that He does in our lives and the lives of other human beings. St. Gregory of Nyssa in the late 5th century, St. Cyril of Alexander... St. Cyril of Alexandria, all of them talk about how it is very holy and good and pious to honor the relics because ultimately what you're doing is giving greater glory to God. And kind of one of the analogies I even use is with the relics, we can imagine we go to museums, we go to, pl go to places where there's great paintings, great statues, and we just admire these things. And we're not necessarily admiring just the statue itself. By admiring the statue, we're giving honor to the painter, to the artist. And so same thing with these saints. When we give them honor and give them veneration, give them admiration, we're actually giving greater glory to God the Creator. I kind of think of it as these are God's masterpieces. This is what it is. When we cooperate with God's grace in our life, this is, some, this is the person we can become, these great saints who are now with God in heaven. And so they give us, they're great role models for us to show us what grace can do in our lives, what God can do our, in our lives if we let Him. And so by honoring these relics, by venerating these relics, we're honoring God and giving glory to God through these people, through these saints who have done great things in their own life because of God's grace. Some of the things that started to happen um, in the early church were that because the relics started to become really highly esteemed, some people even started to sell them and it would make a lot of money. The church eventually forbid them to be sold because they started to have a lot of abuses because people were trying to make money off the relics. 
There even came times where people would go and they would ransack tombs to try to acquire relics. And so the church forbid this. Um, there also became occasions where people would be fraudulent. They would take a piece of a bone and just say that it belonged to some saint. So fraudulent activity did, did start to happen. Um, St. Augustine even talks about how in his own time there were a lot of people trying to pass off these relics that were fake as being the relics of some great saint. And so ultimately what would happen, the church is going to give oversight of relics to the Vatican, um, to Rome, to the Bishop of Rome, so that they can try to protect the relics, so they can try to make sure that there's a decrease in this abuse and in this fraudulent activity. And then eventually it would be customary for a true relic to be accompanied by an, a document of authenticity. And so even today you'll see that where if you have a relic, it'll have a document with it stating that it's a document of authenticity. Now the church has never actually come out and said any one particular relic is absolutely 100% the relic of that particular saint. But what the church says is that if there is this ancient tradition behind a particular relic and that there's a lot of evidence over the centuries that this particular relic belongs to St. Luke or St. Sebastian or St. Agnes, then we can have confidence that, there, it, that this is the relic. And unless there's some overwhelming evidence against it, the church says that it's okay to venerate that relic as the true relic of that particular saint. But the church is very hesitant to come out and say there's any kind of guarantee that this relic is 100% from a particular saint. The church just says if there is very good evidence and strong testimony for a particular relic, then it is, it is good and appropriate to give that relic veneration and honor. The church also will tell us that we're not bound to even venerate relics. So as Catholics, you do not have to venerate relics if you choose not to. The church has told us that it is a very ancient practice and is very pious. It's a good thing to do. And so if you, if you want to do that, you can, but the church does not bound anyone to do it. The church does, does give us caution that we try to make sure that we make sure the church has said that this particular relic is okay to venerate and make sure that we're not kind of searching after some of the potential fraudulent relics. But otherwise the church would say if there's good evidence that it's likely the relic of that particular saint, then it is good and pious to venerate that relic. And then again, the final point, the church says that relics are intended to lead us to God. They're supposed to help turn our hearts and minds to God, help us to get closer and closer to God so that we can reflect on the power of grace in, God, in that saint's life and hopefully allow us to strive to allow grace to do more things in our own life as well. And so we can look at maybe the relics of the cross or the relics from the, the pillar where Jesus was scourged. And we can use those relics and pray, on those rel pray with those relics in front of us to help us maybe have a deeper connection to what happened at that moment in Jesus' life. Or we can have St. Maria Goretti and, and sit in the presence of her relics, her body, and pray about her life and see how it is that we maybe can be better and more like Maria. How is it that we can see the good things in her life that she did and strive to do more in our own life? And so relics should help us to be drawn closer to God. Now it's true that miracles may happen, but we shouldn't be looking for miracles. God will choose to do miracles when, when He wills. But the reason for, uh, for relics is not because there may be a miracle worked through them, though it's possible. The reason is because it's to deepen our love and devotion to God. Now this definitely became abused and so during the uh, Protestant, Revo uh, Protestant revolt um, there were even many people started to reject this idea. Many of the Protestants rejected the idea of having relics and to venerate the saints but the Council of Trent kind of reaffirmed this practice and said that if as long as you're doing this with the right intentions, the right motivation, then it is a good and pious thing to do. Now, the final point about relics is just to kind of go over, just to talk really, really briefly just about Maria Goretti for a few minutes since we will um, have the privilege of having her relic, her body, with us next week. Maria, as if you watch the videos from the diocese website from Father, Father White, he'll kind of go over this as well, but Maria was a young girl who died at the age of 11. 
and she was very faithful to God, she was virtuous, she had a very strong prayer life and what had happened was a young man who was about 20 years old um, tried to rape her and in that process she continued to resist him and because she resisted him he ended up stabbing her 14 times and she ultimately will die from that. But one of the things that happened with Maria is, is Alejandro was the name of the man, the young man who was, who was attacking her. The entire time he was doing this, she continued to care more about his soul than about her own pain and, and suffering. Because she continued to cry out to him, Alejandro, this is a mortal sin, this is a mortal sin, you cannot be doing this, Alejandro. So she was worried more about him and his soul than about her own pain and suffering. And then after he stabs her 14 times, um, he runs off but her family finds her. Within 24 hours, she's going to die. But before she died, she told her mother to make sure that Alejandro knew that she, that Maria, had forgiven him. That was her last, one of her last requests before she died, is to make sure he knew she had forgiven him. And so Maria is this beautiful child, this model of love, of mercy, of forgiveness, and of great faithfulness to God. So when, when, when we're in her presence, when we sit there with her um, sometime next Monday or during the Mass, we can reflect on how we're called to be like Maria. And we can kind of look at our own life and see in what ways can I be more loving to others? In what way can I be more forgiving? In what way can I be more merciful? And also understanding what does it mean to be merciful and what does it mean to love? And we can kind of reflect on that in the presence of, of the relics next week. And then we can even pr ask, ask, Maria, ask Maria to pray for us. Ask for Maria to intercede to God so that he can give, shower us with grace so that we can have more strength and more courage to be more loving and to be more forgiving and to be more merciful. So those are things that we can do in the presence of Maria. But even with any relic, we can kind of reflect on the, the, that person and their life and what they did and how we can kind of imitate that person and how we can continue to ask for more grace to be more like that particular saint. Now the final question of the three that sometimes leads from this discussion is that we talked about how it is that we can ask those in heaven to pray for us. We talked about how the relics, those, are those kind of things that are still here with us on earth, that are kind of the, the reminders of us, of those who have died, the relics, their, their body or their clothing or bone fragments, those things kind of left over here on earth from the saints. That sometimes leads to the next question because it's a, it's a kind of a unique thing to Catholics, and as, you'll, as I'll talk about to Jewish people, why is it that we then pray for those who have died? Because during the Protestant revolt in the 1500s, this practice really went away. Most Protestants do not pray for those who have died. And if you go to funerals, you often will hear them, never hear them talking about we need to pray for the soul of the loved one who has died. But in a Catholic funeral, in a Catholic mass, you, funeral mass, you will always hear that because it's very, very important, um, this practice of praying for those who have died. And so that's our third and final question is why is it that Catholics pray for those who have died? In this picture, in these pictures here, what you'll see is from the very beginning of Christianity, this has always been the practice of praying for the loved ones who have died. This is just a picture of an altar that's in the catacombs in Rome. And in the catacombs, in the tombs, you would, it'd be common to see inscriptions asking for prayers for, for their loved ones. In the earliest Eucharistic liturgies, in the earliest masses, the Eucharistic prayers have always said praying certain prayers for those who have died. So we see in the tombs, in the catacombs, to asking for prayers for those who have died. We see in the earliest mass prayers for those who have died. So from the very beginning of Christianity, this was a common practice. And then we see it time and time again throughout the history of the church, this practice of praying for those who have died. Another common, more popular, I guess, um, example is St. Monica. In St. In Saint August, Augustine's book, The Confessions, he talks about how right before Monica died, she asked him to make sure that when she dies, he prays for her soul. And then he offers mass frequently for her soul. And so we see this over and over and over again over the past many centuries of Catholics praying for the loved ones who have died. So why do we do this? And is this in the Bible? 
What I even want to do is even look back before the time of Christ. Because what you'll find out is that Catholics aren't alone. Jewish people also pray for those who have died. And so this is part of our Jewish roots. And as Christians, we all have Jewish roots. And part of our Jewish roots is to pray for those who have died. In the Bible, in Scripture, there's a particular example of this. In 2 Maccabees chapter 12, towards the end of that section, um, there's a man, Judas, Maccabeus, and what's happened is he's fighting a battle, and he ends up losing some of his men. So at the end of the battle, he goes around checking the bodies of those who have died. And what he ends up finding is on a few of the men, they're wearing these amulets, kind of like these superstitious medallions. And he becomes very, very upset by this because this is not good. This is a sinful thing to do because what's happened that, in, that implies that these men have fallen into superstition and magical ideas. So they've kind of turned from trusting in God completely and now relied on this superstitious practice of these amulets. And so Judas is really upset. He's concerned for the souls of those men who have died. And so what we're told is that he offers prayers for these men who have died and he sends money to the temple in Jerusalem so that sacrifices could be offered for these men who have died. So we're shown in the Bible that this practice happens. And in the last verse, 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verse 46, it actually says, it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead. Now this is the inspired word of God. This is an inspired passage that says it's a holy and wholesome, or some translations say it's a holy and pious thing to pray for the dead. Now sometimes if you're in this, having a conversation with a non-Catholic, they may not have this book of the Bible. They may not have Second Maccabees, but if you, want to have, if you want to talk to me about why that is afterwards, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it because um, this is an inspired book. It's just the Protestants removed it in the 1500s. And so you can still give them the history of the Bible and prove to them why this is an inspired book of the Bible. Um, but that's just an argument and a discussion for another day. But, but this actually is an inspired word of God that tells us that it's holy and pious to pray for those who have died. And this is a very historical practice. The Jewish people, even today, continue to pray for those who have died. So you can still even tell the P Protestant brothers and sisters who may not agree with this book that this is showing us what the Jews did then, and they continue to practice that today. So it's a historical reality that the Jews pray for those who have died. Now there's three particular Jewish prayers that they still do today. And so I think if you just kind of at least are familiar with these, you can help in your discussions with um, non-Catholics as to see the Jewish people still do it today. So this was something that has been from the beginning, even before the time of Christ, that the Jewish people did this. So there's one of the Jewish prayers, it's called the Mourner's Kaddish. The word Kaddish kind of comes from this word that basically means to be sanctified. And this is a prayer that the Jewish people will say for their deceased family members or friends. They'll say the prayer for about 11 months. They'll say it every day for about 11 months. And so they'll, they'll say this prayer regularly for 11 months for the deceased because they do believe that after death there is some type of trial or tribulation that the person must go through. There's some type of process of being made pure. There's some type of process of sanctification, so they pray for their loved one during this time. There's another prayer that they'll say that's called the Yizkor. This kind of comes from a word that means He, meaning God. God will remember. And there's another Jewish prayer for the dead, the El Mali Rahamim, which means God full of mercy. And so these are prayers that during the high feast days of the year, four times a year, the Jewish people will say these prayers for the deceased, for the loved ones who have died. And another tradition that the Jewish people do is on the anniversary of the day their loved one died, they'll say prayers, they'll, do, they'll read some type of scripture, they'll even do charitable works and offer them for the soul of their loved one that has died. And so we see this practice among the Jewish people, praying for those who have died, caring about the soul of those who have died, knowing there's something more that has to happen before they can be in the presence of God. Now why is that important? Because who also were, were Jewish? 
Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Peter, Paul, the apostles, they were Jewish. They would have been very familiar with this practice. And what we know is that our Jewish roots, many of the practices of the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition have been fulfilled in Christ. And so what we know is Christ has come to show us the reality of why it is important to pray for those who have died. And we're going to talk about that next. Why is it that it's important to pray for those who have died? And who is it exactly that we're praying for? But this is a Jewish tradition, and we can see that it continues in its fulfillment in the new Israel, which is the church. So to kind of understand who it is we're praying for and why we're praying, we have to take a little bit of a step back just for a minute and have a little bit of a digression about what happens when we die. We're just going to shortly kind of cover this very quickly so that you can understand the reality of, of prayers for those who have died. So first we know when we die, it means it's the end of this earthly life. And we're told in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that every man dies once, and then, be, then comes judgment. So what we know is that when we die, we're immediately judged. We will be at the seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. We will stand before Christ and we will be judged. He will evaluate our entire life. Everything we've said or done or haven't said or haven't done, good and bad, it's all going to be put before us and Christ will judge us. And what scripture in the church tells us is that with judgment, there's going to be two ultimate destinies for a particular soul. So a particular soul will be eternally destined for hell if they have kind of the following situation. They've rejected God, so they die, and they've rejected God in their earthly life. They're not united to Christ. They've rejected God's grace, or they've rejected it such that they're not faithful to God, they're not obedient to God. And as the church would describe it, they're not in a state of grace. They don't have grace in their soul. And this can happen for various reasons. You can commit what's called like a mortal sin, a deadly sin. Those are those sins that are very grave, they're very serious. And they're things that God tells us through His church to not do. And there's things that we, they're serious, we know they're serious, and we do them anyways. Those are potentially mortal sins. And if we commit a mortal sin, we lose grace from our soul. Now, if we go to the sacrament of confession, that grace will be restored. But if we commit a mortal sin and we're unrepentant, we're not sorry, then we do not have grace in our soul. And if we die at that moment, then you know, our salvation will definitely be in question. And what Scripture in the church tells us is that you must have grace to be able to enter heaven. If you die without grace, then it's likely that you'll be in hell because those are the necessary requirements to be in heaven is to have grace in your soul. And you must love God, you must be united to Christ. Now if we die and we're judged, those who will be eternally destined to heaven need to, need to have these things. They need to love God, they need to be united to Christ, they need to have cooperated with grace, so they need to have been faithful and obedient to God, cooperating with grace. And they need to be in, in kind of what the church describes as being in a state of grace. You have grace in your soul. And if you meet those criteria, then ultimately you will go to heaven. But there's a few things we also have to recognize that Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that to be in heaven, in the presence of God, we must be perfect, we must be pure, and we must be holy. So we must be perfect, we must be absolutely pure and absolutely holy to be in the presence of God. And you can see the various scripture passages that kind of show that evidence that are up there. So we must be perfect and pure and holy. So what happens that when, if when we die, we have grace in our soul, but we're not yet completely perfect. We're not yet absolutely pure and holy. What happens? Well, because of God's merciful love, He has, this, he has created this state of existence that's called purgatory. And purgatory is for those people who die in a state of grace. They love God. They're united to Christ, but they're not yet 
absolutely perfect and pure and holy. They go through this process of being purified. Go, go through this process of being made perfect so that they can enter heaven. So here's a little bit of a depiction just to kind of summarize things. So when we die, man is judged immediately, sits before Christ, and there's going to be two ultimate destinies, either heaven or hell. Now for those who are going to hell, it's eternal. There's no second chance. All our, our time of grace, our time of mercy is right now in our earthly life. And so if we die and we reject God, we do not love God, we don't have grace in our soul, then we will be judged and our destiny will be hell. But if we have grace and we love God, we'll be, our destiny will be heaven. But for those people who die and who are not yet perfectly, absolutely pure and perfect, they'll go through purgatory. So purgatory is not a second chance. It's not for those who are going to go to hell and now they get a second chance to go to heaven. It's for those who die loving God, loving Christ, in a state of grace, but are not yet perfect. They'll go through purgatory to get to heaven. Now just a few ideas just to help us a little bit better understand this idea of purgatory because I have a whole talk I think it was about a year ago on purgatory that's online I think at the cathedral website but just to kind of briefly talk about a few points. So scripture tells us in many places that God is this refiner, he's a purifier and often what it will reference is gold or silver, some type of precious metal. And it'll say that God is a purifier of gold. He tests things and he, he purifies them through fire so they can be made perfect and be made pure. So we know that God is a refiner. He's a purifier. And we see that in many examples and he does the same with us. God works to purify us and to refine us and to make us perfect. This term, sanctification, that we hear sometimes in Scripture, that word be means being made holy. So we can also look at it as this idea of being made pure and perfect. Being made, um, being made so perfect that we can enter heaven. This begins in our earthly life. This process of being made holy, being made perfect, begins in this earthly life. But at the moment of our death, if we're not yet perfect, then that process will be completed after death, through purgatory. There's a lot of scriptural examples of purgatory and, and things that hint at that. And if you want more, I can give them to you at the end. But a key one is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. In this passage, Paul talks about how during this earthly life, our foundation is Christ. But sometimes we can build things on that foundation that aren't always good. So he uses the analogy of precious metals and then straw and hay and wood. And he says on the last day, on our day of judgment, we're going to be, we're going to go through fire and all those things that aren't pure and perfect will be burned away. It's like the wood and the straw and the hay, all those things will be burned off and then all that's left are those perfect precious metals in this analogy of 1 Corinthians 3.15. So he talks about how these people are saved but through fire. So this idea of being purified, this idea of being made perfect. And so again, that's this idea of purgatory. And just for one final kind of anal an an analogy, kind of a story to kind of help you see this, is the story of the silversmith. Now if you heard my talk on purgatory, I used the same analogy, but I think it helps us to understand what being made perfect is, what purgatory is. And so it's the idea of a, of a goldsmith. Let's say you have a goldsmith. And the goldsmith is going to take gold and he's going to purify it and make it perfect. So how does he do that? He's going to take the, the piece of gold that he has, he's going to put it under fire in very intense heat. And he's going to heat it up for a while and that's going to result in the impurities coming to the surface. And so that's kind of called dross, D-R-O-S-S, -S, dross. It'll come to the surface, those are the impurities. Then he'll take the gold out, he'll wipe away the impurities, put it back in the intense heat, let that happen again where the impurities rise to the surface and then over and over and over he'll put it in the fire and continue to do that to get the impurities out of that metal. Now how does the goldsmith know when that piece of gold is perfectly pure and, and perfect? It's when he can see his own reflection in it. And so the same thing applies to us. Similarly, God puts us through things like suffering in this earthly life 
and even in purgatory, the, the fires of purgatory will be a, a, an experience of pain and suffering, but that suffering is, is purgatorial, it's purifying, it purges us of any impurities and imperfections that we have, and so we'll continue to experience suffering so that we can be made holy and be made perfect. And how does God know when we are made perfect? when he can see his reflection in us. And so that's the ultimate goal, is so that we can be made perfect, so that God can see his reflection in us. And so when we die, if we're not yet perfect, then we'll go through this state of purgatory, this purgatorial suffering, this purgatorial um, cleansing, so that we can be made perfect, so that we can enter heaven and be in the presence of God. So again, just that little depiction one more time, Purgatory is not a second chance. It's for those who need to be made perfect. They die in a state of grace, but need to be made perfect. And so they're going to experience this, this period of suffering. It's this state of suffering so they can be made perfect and purified. So having kind of said that, we talk about how we have prayers to the dead. We pray for those who have died. So we have scripture where Judas, in, in the book of Maccabees, prays for those who have died. We have the Jewish tradition, the Jews have in the past and continue today to pray for those who have died. And then Christians from the earliest times have prayed for those who have died. So then we have to ask, well, who are they praying for? So are they praying for those in heaven? No, because those in heaven don't need our prayers. They've already achieved that imperishable crown of eternal life. There's nothing more that we can do to help them. They are now in heaven, united to God. They're perfect. They've been made perfect and pure. They're now in heaven. They don't need our prayers. They can pray for us, but they don't need our prayers. Now, are we praying for those in hell? The answer is no, because those in hell cannot benefit from our prayers either. They are now in hell eternally. They don't have a second chance. The time of grace and mercy is here on earth. And so their time of, of making that free choice to reject God ha is over. At death, that decision had been made. They had freely chosen to reject God. And so our prayers do not benefit those who are in hell. So who are they praying for? It's for the souls in purgatory. That's who our prayers are for. Because those in this state of purgatory are experiencing suffering. They're being made perfect. And so what the church tells us is that our prayers are beneficial for them. We can help to decrease the degree of suffering that they're experiencing. We can try to help make it a little bit quicker of a process for them to be made pur purified so they can enter heaven more quickly. We can kind of pray for them so that, that process will be quick and they can get to heaven and be in the presence of God and be with the angels and the saints. So our prayers are for those who have died and who are in purgatory. That's who our prayers are for. And that's who the, even though the Jewish people don't have a complete understanding of what happens in life after death, because that fulfillment of understanding came through Christ, that's also kind of what the Jew, Jewish people are praying for without even fully understanding it. But that's what Christ and the Christians have prayed for from the beginning, are those people who are in purgatory. Now that kind of brings us back full circle to this idea of the communion of saints. And I think that's an important thing just for all the topics of tonight is this communion of saints. The communion of saints are all those united to Christ through baptism who love God and are faithful and obedient. It includes those of us here in this earthly life. Now we're imperfectly united to Christ, but we're still united to Him in a part of the communion of saints. We can continue to pray for each other, all of those of us here on earth, because of love, because we care for each other, we want everyone to be in heaven. And we can also pray for those in purgatory, because they still can benefit from our prayers. And then those in heaven are also a part of the communion of saints. They too can pray for us. They don't need our prayers. There's no longer any need for that, but they can pray for us here on earth. And they can also pray for those in purgatory. And then the third group that's a part of the communion of saints are those in purgatory. Those in purgatory are still united to Christ. They've died 
united to Christ and they're just on this process before entering heaven, this purgatorial suffering, and, and they will one day soon be in heaven. And so those in purgatory are still a part of the communion of saints. Those in purgatory can no longer pray for themselves and they can no longer do penance for themselves, but they can still pray for us and they definitely want us to pray for them and they want those in heaven to continue praying for them and that's what we do that's the beauty of this communion of saints we're all a communion together this unity of people united to Christ who care for each other and who love each other and as Christ, uh, Saint Paul tells us that all the members of the communion of saints love each other such that if one person suffers we all suffer if one person rejoices we all rejoice now that applies to all of us here on earth when, we, when others suffer, we suffer with them. When others rejoice, we rejoice with them. Now, it's a little different in heaven because there's no suffering in heaven. So they no longer are suffering, but they can definitely rejoice along with us. And they can reach out and pray for us and try to help us in any way possible. But this communion of saints, this body of Christ, is united in this beautiful way so that we can all continue to care for each other, whether or not, whether or not we're in this life or if we've passed on to the next life. We continue to love and to care for each other and to help each other in every way possible. And this is just a great gift that God has given us. And so I would encourage you to definitely make sure you pray. Pray for each other, pray for those in purgatory, and then reach out to those in heaven who are perfectly united to Christ, who prayer, whose prayers are very powerful, so, and asking, asking them to continue to pray for each of us throughout our earthly life. Now, I'm going to definitely welcome any questions that you have, but I know that some people may want to leave early, and so I want to close in prayer before we start a answering questions, just to kind of close, just in a moment of prayer together. And since we have been talking a lot tonight about praying to those in heaven, and because our bishop has also asked us to really say the St. Michael prayer a lot more frequently in our day-to-day -day life, I just think it would be good for us to kind of pray that together as we close tonight. Um, and then I would encourage you to continue praying and having an even deeper prayer life after you leave tonight. So uh, let's join together in St. Michael prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, witness in battle, be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And St. Maria Goretti, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I will welcome any questions, and then if you want to contact me, that's my information up there as well. So thank you for having me tonight, and like I said, I'll stay here as long as I need to if y'all have questions, so feel free. Yes. Okay. Okay. I have a check that was in the So she says she has a she has a check that was canceled check. Okay. A third. A third. So she's saying that she has something signed by Mother Teresa. So that would be like a third class relic. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm. Not really. I mean, it's just something you can just cherish. Yeah, you can just cherish it. Mm -hmm. So she had asked if she had to do anything since she had this paper signed by Maria, Mother Teresa, but it's just something you can cherish, but it is a third class relic. Okay, and I always understood that the Blessed Mother was the mediatrix of all graces. How does that Okay. 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 So Betty, uh, Betty's asking about the term that's sometimes given to Mary about being the mediatrix of all graces and how does that relate to God being the mediator. So it's a little bit of a different topic in a sense, but what it's just talking about is how Mary, because she is the mother of God, she's the mother of Jesus, she can intercede for us. And there's a, that, that, that kind of the answer of what it means by being co-redemptrix and mediatrix kind of goes into a whole lot that maybe we'll save for another time, but I, I can kind of answer it in this way. There's a great analogy in Scripture. If you look in the Old Testament, you have King David and his wife Bathsheba, and 
you have King David and then Bathsheba was his wife. Now at the time that King David was the king, she wasn't the queen because that's not how it worked at that time. So whenever King David and Bathsheba have a son, it's Solomon. Once Solomon becomes king, then we have Bathsheba becoming queen because it was the mother of the king that would become the queen. So you would have the queen mother and then the king would be her son. And there's a great um, example in, in I think it's in 2 Kings, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, whenever there is a member of the community, a member of the kingdom, this man comes to Queen Bathsheba and she asks Queen, but he asks Queen Bathsheba, could you intercede to the king for me? And so she does. The queen, that was one of the things that she would do in the kingdom of David is that the queen mother would often intercede for the people to her son, the king. And so she then went to Solomon. Now Solomon didn't grant the request of this person because they weren't asking for something that was good, but she still took that request to King Solomon and that's what the queen mother would do. And so then we see in that encounter, um, Queen King Solomon actually bows down to his mother when she enters the room because she's queen mother and he respects her for that. He honors his mother and respects her role as queen and she came and interceded for him. So Mary does the same thing. She is the queen mother because she is Jesus' mother. She's the mother of God and so as queen she can intercede for us. And she does that in a little bit of a special way because she is the queen mother. But every saint in heaven can intercede but Mary does have a little special role because she's the queen mother. Jesus is the king Jesus is her son, and because he's now in this new Davidic kingdom, she becomes the queen mother. So she can inter intercede for us in a special way. If that kind of answers your question a little bit, it doesn't completely go into all the details of that term, but I think that probably is the best kind of analogy to use for what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Other questions? No? You understood everything perfect? Yes. This, uh, Maria, now is that her actual body? Is she not she, Well, no, that's not her body that you see. It's a little kind of an encasing. She, she is not one of the incorruptibles. So incorruptibles, there are some saints who have never corrupted and their bodies still look like they did when they died, but she's not one of them. That's just like this plastic encasing or it's some material of an encasing. She's within it, but what you're seeing is not her body. And sometimes it is confusing because they've made it kind of look like her. So that's a common question is, is she one of the incorruptibles? But that's not her body you're seeing. It's just the, the encasing. Her body's within that, though. Mm -hmm. Now, if we touch things to that reliquary, will that make them a third? Um, I, I don't know if it would technically be since you, you're not actually touching her body, but you will? Okay. So there we go. He said yes. You can make it a third class relic if you touch it. To Peyton, Peyton said that. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know. It's not her body, so I don't know. So yes, okay. So there you go. But she's in the glass. She is in the glass. So he's saying if he's saying if you touch it to the glass, they've made the glass whole, sacred also. So there you go. So you can bring your rosaries, holy cards. Mm hmm There you go. But I just want to share our practice, well, even here. When someone died, a family member, a lot of friends would get together for nine, nine, nine days, mm -hmm. and we pray together for that soul. That's good. And then after 40 days, we have a mass for that soul, because sometimes you think maybe they're in purgatory, mm -hmm. and our prayers, so we do that, you know. Right, and that's, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And every year for their birthday, for the uh, the day that they die, we always have mass. That's good. And, mm -hmm. and uh, November one, two. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good tradition because we need we cannot forget about the souls of our loved ones who have died but I also even think about how many people who aren't Catholic who have died and they have no one praying for them yeah. because they don't even know the reality of purgatory and the need for their prayers so, so. when you pray the rosary you just mm -hmm. say uh, offer me for the soul in purgatory right offer it for the soul right it, mm -hmm. they'll pray for you yeah absolutely I mean offer mass I mean but that's particularly the 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 feast days coming up, um, you have All Saints Day, which is for the saints, and then All Souls Day, which is honoring all those who have died. So we are praying for all those souls in purgatory. So it is something that's really beautiful and, and very pious to do because they need our prayers. And I know, like she said, when they get to heaven, they'll, they'll remember. 
what we've done for them. But, but you can offer, you can actually offer penance or indulgences for yourself or for those in purgatory as well. So it's something also to continue to do. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Did you say that the Psalms of Purgatory cannot pray for us? They can pray for us. They can't pray for themselves. They, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. they can't. They can't merit. Right. They can't merit anything for themselves. They can't do any more penance. But they can pray for us. Yeah, you said a while ago that once the person has uh, died, they will be judged mm-hmm. directly, mm-hmm. automatically. But what about the Nicene Creed that states that? The, the God will be ju- uh, we will be judged uh, both believing mm-hmm. and dead. So, mm-hmm. so there's th- there's two there's two judgments. So there's one. The first judgment is called the particular judgment. That happens right when we die. When we die, we're judged immediately, and we'll know if we're going to be in heaven or hell. We'll know if we need to go through purgatory. Then there's also something that's called the general judgment, which is going to happen on the last day. And so on the last day, there'll also be a general judgment, and that's going to be anyone who had died before that time, or anyone who's still alive, um, who hasn't died yet, when that day of judgment comes, everyone will be judged. And then that will be more of a public judgment. So you will, it's, your, your judgment won't change. Like let's say someone who's died before, they've already been judged to heaven or hell, their judgment won't change on that last day. It's just going to become public now. Everyone's going to understand why people are in heaven, why people are in hell. Um, you're going to be able to witness God's perfect justice for those who are in hell, and you're going to witness God's perfect mercy for those who are in heaven. So it's going to be like this public um, judgment that's going to happen. And at that moment, too, our bodies and souls will be reunited, and so we'll also have that experience as well. So the resurrection of the body and will be reunited with the soul, and then we'll have this general judgment. So there's two judgments that will take place. It's just the particular judgment is my particular judgment for me, and then the general judgment will reveal that publicly to everyone. Make sense? Okay. How yes, ma'am. Oh, one second. Go ahead. Okay. I have uh, been told by some uh, Eucharistic Franciscan sisters that when they lose something, instead of praying to St. Anthony, the patron of lost articles, they pray to the souls in purgatory, oh. and they get better results. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if everyone heard that, but she said that the um, Eucharistic sisters have said, to, instead of praying to St. Anthony, if you lose something, pray to the souls in purgatory. They've had better success. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So her question is, how do you know if someone's entered heaven? You don't really know. I mean, the, the, the church has declared certain people saints. So the, ones, the people who are canonized saints are the ones who the church tells us they know because of various um, examples, miracles, and other things. They know they're in heaven. But for the majority of people, there's a lot of people, there's a lot more people in heaven probably than that are canonized saints. So, but for the general typical person, we don't know. And so there's not really a way for us to know. Now, sometimes people, um, I've heard, you know, definitely offer prayers. And I think kind of the practice of doing some set period of time, whether it's 40 days or praying, you know, for a year regularly and offering Mass on their anniversary every year. I mean, you can, even if they're in heaven, I mean, God's going to understand, I mean, God knows that we don't, God knows we don't know when they're in heaven, so he'll definitely um, kind of allow those prayers we're offering them to still be beneficial in some way. Um, So, I mean, I think there's most likely most of us aren't going to know if our loved ones are in heaven or not. So God just tells us to continue to pray for them, and, you know, we can have the, um, you know, we can't really know, we can have some confidence based on our assessment of how they live their life, but we really can't know for certainty until we get to heaven ourselves. So, so we, yeah. If we have a bunch of people, a bunch of, uh, you know, praying, or that we, you know that they're in the, that stage of purgatory, and then we reach heaven, we really don't need to stay or pray for them anymore. Right, if we know they're in heaven, we don't have to pray for them anymore. Mm-hmm. But since we do not know that, right. when they're going to get to that point, we just need Keep praying. Exactly. Since we don't know, I mean, until there's somehow we know with certainty, you keep praying. I mean, the church could potentially tell you a particular person's been a canonized saint, but until that happens, we don't know, so keep praying for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you for coming.